Welcome AP Biology students. This is uh, Unit 8, Topic Number 2, looking at energy flow through ecosystems. So ecosystems and energy. Ultimately, ecosystems are the sum of all organisms living in a given area. And the biotic and uh, factors they interact with. So when we get to that, that hierarchical level of organization, the ecosystem is where we see the living world interacting with the living world and the living world interacting with the non-living world. And when we talk about the living and the non-living world, we're looking at biotic and abiotic factors. And biotic factors are going to be those components of an ecosystem that are living or once living components of an environment. And then you throw that letter A in front of a word and it means not or non. The abiotic factors become the non-living components of an ecosystem. And the non-living components include those things such as the physical and chemical properties that truly make up the non-living part of our environment to which we live. So what I'd like you to do is just think about the outside or go outside, whatever you want to do, and write down three abiotic and three biotic factors in your notebook as examples. So let's talk about energy. Energy itself is the ability to do work. And when we talked about energy previously, when we did cellular respiration and photosynthesis, we really came to understand the laws of thermodynamics, and which is a physics concept. And when we talk about the laws of thermodynamics, there are two important laws that we looked at specifically when we did the two big biochemical pathways. And the first one is the first law of thermodynamics, which is the law of conservation of energy. And unlike the law of conservation of mass, which states that chemical elements are continually recycled in the environment, the law of conservation of energy tells us that first law, that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. However, energy can be transformed from one type of energy to another type of energy. And you see this when you're swinging on a swing or if you're looking at a pendulum, you could see that uh, as it swings forwards and backwards, you're seeing energy transformations go between kinetic and potential. And energy has a one directional flow. Um, so in, in that sense, it truly is not recycled in the environment, but we don't see that with the law of conservation of mass because chemical elements are continually recycled in the environment. And I'll talk about that a little bit later in this lecture. And then there's the second law of thermodynamics that pretty much tells us that exchanges of energy increases the entropy of the universe. If you recall, entropy is an uh, increase in the disorder of the universe. And we know that during every energy change, energy conversions are not 100% efficient and you always lose some of that energy, often in the form of heat. And, and that's what we're going to see here as we get in our studies of ecology. So <clears throat> when we talk about ecosystems of energy, we look at a net gain of energy and a net loss of energy. Because ultimately, that net gain or net loss of energy is going to lead to or, or not lead to an increase in mass, which could ultimately uh, cause growth in the organism. So when you have a net gain of energy, it results in energy storage or growth of an organism or an increase in mass. Or on the other end, a net loss of energy results in a loss of mass and eventually will lead up to death of an organism. So when we talk about organ yeah, when we talk about organisms, uh, we often talk about and we think of energy, we think of metabolism. And metabolism is that that word that we hear of in biology. Oh, sorry. That word that we hear of in biology that ultimately uh, describes the totality, or in other words, the sum of all the chemical reactions within a living thing. But the metabolic rate is the total amount of energy an animal uses in a unit of time. And it can be measured in calories, and a calorie itself is the amount of energy that's required to change the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Or it could be uh, measured in terms of heat loss, or it could be measured in terms of the consumption or production of gases like oxygen gas and carbon dioxide gas. And we saw the production and consumption of oxygen gas and carbon dioxide gas in our two meta metabolic pathways or biochemical pathways of cellular respiration and photosynthesis, where those reactants and products are ultimately the reverse of one another. 
So an animal's metabolic rate is related to its body mass, and ultimately smaller organisms have higher metabolic rates, and larger organisms are going to have lower metabolic rates. It's partially due to the surface area to volume ratio. And uh, when we talk about the surface, it's relative to the volume of metabolizing tissue. And ultimately, um, when you have that larger volume there, you're going to have a lot more heat loss when you're looking at metabolic rate. Because remember, when we eat things and take things in, or if you're a producer, like a plant, and you're photosynthesizing, you're converting one form of energy to a different form of energy. And then as we eat things, we're converting that chemical energy into mechanical energy, or we're storing it, etc. So all those energy conversions are ultimately not 100% efficient according to that second law of thermodynamics. So when we look at ecosystems and energy, organisms use different strategies to regulate body temperature. And there are two basic types of organisms that when we talk about temperature regulation, there's those that do uh, do uh, temperature regulation internally. We call those endotherms or endothermic organisms. So we look at the word endo, it means in, therm means heat. So they use thermal energy from metabolism, those chemical reactions that are taking place to maintain a stable internal temperature condition. For mammals like us, the human species, our internal body temperature is around 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. But on the other end, ectotherms, they regulate their temperature, as the word implies, outside. Ecto means outside. So they're going to use external sources uh, to regulate their body temperature. And organisms that do this are things like reptiles, like lizards and snakes, where you'll see them either sunbathing to raise their body temperature, or they'll go in the shade to help lower their body temperature. But ultimately, when we look at temperature, um, temperature plays a role with chemical reactions and metabolism. And, and we know that um, based on when we did our enzyme studies, because a lot of biochemical reactions need enzymes to function, and there's these optimal temperatures at which enzymes work. So we get our energy from food, and ultimately trophic levels are our feeding relationships. And when we look at this trophic level here, we can see that species can be grouped into trophic levels based upon their main source of nutrition and energy. So the ultimate source of energy to our planet for almost uh, all things is that of the sun. But it, I can't say all things because we do have organisms that live in the ocean deep. And this here is looking at an energy pyramid. And in this energy pyramid, you see the primary producer, primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers, and apex predators. And ultimately, it's going to be those primary producers that are going to carry out photosynthesis and ultimately use that energy from the sun to convert it into some usable sort of chemical energy. And then as primary producers are eaten by primary consumers, which are herbivores, you have an energy transformation there. And if you're looking at the values here, it goes from a... a a hundred to ten to one to point one to point zero one. Ultimately, during every energy conversion, only ten percent of that energy is being passed on. The other amount of that energy is typically lost. Energy is lost as heat, and that's what we see over here. So during every energy conversion, we're going to lose some of that energy in the form of heat. We also have decomposers, and decomposers help recycle those nutrients. If we think of that law of conservation of mass when we're looking at those two laws of thermodynamics decomposers play a huge role in breaking down uh those uh detritus that detritus dead decaying organic matter and and putting those nutrients back into the soil back into those biogeochemical cycles so let's take a look at each trophic level or feeding relationship here so just remember unlike mass energy cannot be recycled and the sun constantly supplies energy to ecosystems. So unlike the resources we have on our planet and the things that we have available to us for survival and to keep us safe, those things are here on the planet. And once we use them wastefully, they're going to be gone because our planet is a closed system to resources with the exception of two things. Our planet is an open system to one, sunlight. Sunlight enters our planet daily during the day, 
And two, at night, we have thermal energy or heat energy that escapes our planet and goes out in the outer space. So when we look at, at trophic levels, that, that bottom level of the pyramid, those primary producers, are going to play a huge role. And go, they are going to determine what the pyramid looks like at all other trophic levels. So the primary producers are autotrophs, and they're going to use light energy to synthesize organic compounds. And when we talk about autotrophs, we're looking at things that are self-feeders, such as the, the name implies, auto self troph feeder. And when we talk about them using light energy, these are going to be photoautotrophs because they're going to carry out the process of photosynthesis to synthesize those organic compounds. And plants, algae, and photosynthetic plankton are all examples of photoautotrophs. However, not all organisms are able to carry out photosynthesis, for example, those in the ocean deep. If you think about it, light energy can only penetrate about 30 meters into the depths of the ocean. And then after that, uh, you start at the twilight zone and then the dark zone. And there, because the sunlight cannot reach the bottom of the ocean floor, we need another type of autotrophs there. And those are going to be chemoautotrophs. And chemoautotrophs are going to carry out a process known as chemosynthesis because those organisms are chemosynthetic. And that means that they produce food using the energy created by chemical reactions. And organisms that do this are bacteria. And there are two basic kingdoms of bacteria. The true bacteria, which are just referred to as bacteria. And then you have those bacteria that are considered extremophiles. And those are the archaea organisms. And the archaeans are like those purple sulfurous bacteria that could tolerate high concentration of sulfur. And that's important because where they're getting their energy from at the bottom of the ocean floor are these hydrothermal vents. And these hydrothermal vents are spewing out this hydrogen sulfide gas that they're using the, that chemical compound to co convert into food energy since they are the primary producers in the ocean deep. So they are the basis of the food chain for ocean, ocean organisms that live in the deep ocean. Obviously, it would be those photoautotrophs that are going to serve um, for as the foundation of food for the uh, ocean creatures that live closest closer to the surface. And then there are heterotrophs, and as the name applies, these are going to be other feeders. And heterotrophs are going to rely on autotrophs for energy because they cannot make their own food internally. So there are several types of heterotrophic organisms. There are the primary consumers, which are going to be herbivores. There are secondary consumers, which are carnivores that specifically eat herbivores. Tertiary consumers are going to be carnivores that eat other carnivores. And then you have apex consumers, and those truly are the apex predators. Those are going to be dominant in the food chain. Humans are apex predators. If we think of the ocean, a, sh a great white shark would be an apex predator there. And then, of course, we have those decomposers. And decomposers get energy from detritus. And detritus is that non-living organic leaf, wood, and dead organism, that matter, that you see often if on the ocean, or not, not on the ocean floor, a forest floor. And uh, decomposers are going to break that down and recycle those nutrients back into the earth. Um, examples of decomposers include things that like fungi, which are mushrooms and molds, and bacteria, those prokaryotic organisms. So looking at trophic structure, we often look at feeding relationships using food chains and food webs. So a trophic structure, ultimately, the trophic stru structure of a community are determined by feeding relationships between those organisms. And off to the side there, you can see a food chain, which is a linear transfer to food energy up through the different trophic levels. And then obviously a food chain is just one linear flow of energy through a uh, transfer of food energy that belongs to the great greater scheme of things known as a food web and food webs are more complex because it's going to be multiple food chains that are linked together but ultimately when you look at this food chain that's in the example here you see a little krill which is eaten by a small minnow which is eaten by a striped bass which ultimately is going to be eaten by a pike and that pike ultimately gets eaten by the osprey so if you look at the arrows, notice the arrows show the transfer of energy. That is, the fish is energy for the bird. 
So the, the arrow points to the osprey there. It doesn't point to the fish, which is being eaten, because it's showing the direction at which energy is flowing through that particular food chain. And here you can see another example of the food chain right there. Producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, and the tertiary consumer. So when we look at trophic levels, any changes in the availability of energy can disrupt an ecosystem. For example, if energy resources change, so can the, the number and size of the trophic levels uh, cause an increase, an increase in trophic level levels or trophic level size, cause a decrease or a decrease in trophic levels and trophic level size. So a change at the producer level, those chemoautotrophs and photoautotrophs can ultimately affect the number and the size of the remaining trophic levels that exist above that level because ultimately they are taking that for uh, that initial source of energy and converting it into all other usable forms of energy that are needed by organisms who are not producers themselves those are going to be the heterotrophs so let's take a look at, at light energy and and its relationship to convert a chemical energy and we're going to look at a topic called primary product production and primary productivity is the amount of light energy that is converted to chemical energy. And primary producers set a spending limit, so to speak, for the entire ecosystem's energy budget. Um, ultimately, we have two terms here now that we need to come to understand. The gross primary production, known as the GPP, that's going to be the total primary production in an ecosystem, versus the net primary production, the NPP, which is the GPP minus the energy used by the primary producers for respiration. Here's a good example of looking at the primary production. Uh, this would be during the, the summer times uh, in the northern hemisphere there, where we could see a satellite image that shows the different ecosystems have varying NPP. So what areas have higher NPP or net primary productivity are those areas that are going to be around the tropical region. And if you look there in the continents of especially South America, uh, the middle there of Africa, and then you have Indonesia there, uh, they're very dark green. So they're going to have high uh, primary production there. And that's because of the tropical rainforest and that lush fo uh, foliage of the rainforest that's there to harness that solar energy for photosynthesis. And then as you migrate away towards the, the poles of Earth, you can see that that net primary productivity actually decreases. Secondary production is ultimately the amount of chemical energy in a consumer's food that is converted to new biomass. So ultimately, when we think of, of that, we go back to that idea of the transfer of energy between trophic levels is around 20%, 10% efficiency. Um, when we think of this, 10% efficiency, that's the 10% rule of ecology again that states that only 10% of that energy gets passed on from one trophic level to the next, and typically the rest is lost as heat. So let's say that a deer is eating grass, and then ultimately um, the deer there uh, is going to eat that grass and break it down into organic compounds to use for cellular respiration. Um, some of that grass, that uh, that material is going to be released as feces, um, etc. And then the deer is also going to uh, lose some heat in the process of cellular respiration as it uses the energy to do so. This is why energy flows through ecosystems rather than being recycled, as we see with nutrients. So here you can see two examples there, uh, one of an aquatic ecosystem and another of a terrestrial ecosystem. So let's take one last look at matter cycling um, because we did a lot with energy. Now let's look at that law of conservation of mass and, and our matter there. And we see that energy, unlike energy, matter cycles through ecosystems. And matter is found in limited amounts, unlike solar energy. And when we talk about the cycling of matter, we're going to talk about that cycling of matter through biogeochemical cycles. And if we break that big word down, biogeochemical, it is what it means. It means that you're going to have chemicals that are being cycled through bio, living things, and geo, 
non-living things, earthly components. So we have the cycling of chemicals or nutrient cycles that contain both uh, cycling through biotic and abiotic factors of the ecosystem. And the best example of matter cycling is going to come with water, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, um, looking at those different cycles. So we're not going to get too in detail with these, but just understand what their importance is related to biology. The water cycle or the hydrologic cycle ultimately has biological importance because water is essential for all life and influences the rate of ecosystem processes. And in eighth grade earth and space science, you looked at this, you studied these different components of evaporation, condensation, transpiration is that special type of evaporation from plants when those stomata are open, um, runoff, precipitation, groundwater, etc. There's also the cycling of carbon. Um, the carbon cycle is important biologically because carbon is essential for life. We are carbon-based organisms and all living things are carbon-based organisms. And carbon is required for the formation of the organic compounds that are essential to living things, those macromolecule groups, the carbohydrates, the fats and lipids, the amino acids and the proteins, and the nucleic acids. Speaking of amino acids and proteins, here's where we could see the nitrogen cycle come into play because nitrogen is a key element in both the formation of amino acids and proteins and it's also important to nucleic acids like DNA and RNA because we have those nitrogenous bases that make up those polynucleotides. And then the phosphorus cycle. That has biological importance because phosphorus is important for the formation of nucleic acids like DNA and RNA as they have that backbone that is alternating sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. That's where phosphorus comes into play. Phosphorus is also a component of phospholipids. Just to recall, phospholipids are fats. They're, they're the lipids that make up the major component of every biological membrane, whether it be the cell membrane or the membrane that surrounds, for saying, an organelle like the mitochondria or the chloroplast. And they also are, phosphorus is also found in ATP, which it's in its name, adenosine triphosphate. You have those three phosphate groups there. So, um, these are the topic two notes. I thank you for tuning into this lecture. We have two more lectures to go, and that is it. So keep giving me your best you. Don't give up now. We're going to home plate. And as always, thank you for being you. Have a great day, everybody.